The next talk is about how risky is software you use. So you maybe heard about um, Trump versus a, a Russian security company. Um, we won't judge this, we won't comment this, but um, we dislike the prejudgments of this case. Tim Carstens and Parker Thompson will tell you a little bit more about how risky the software is you use. Uh, Tim Carstens is uh, CITL's acting director and Parker Thompson is CITL's lead engineer. Please welcome with a very, very warm applause, Tim and Parker. Thanks. Thank you. Hmm. Howdy. <laughs> Howdy. Uh, so uh, my name is Tim Carstens. I'm the acting director of the Cyber Independent Testing Lab. There's four words there. We'll talk about all four today, especially cyber. <laughs> uh, with me today is our lead engineer, Parker Thompson. Uh, not on stage are our other collaborators, uh, Patrick Stack, uh, Sarah Zatko, and present in the room, but not on stage, Mudge. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about our work, uh, the lead-in. Uh, the introduction that was given is a phrase in terms of Kaspersky and all of that. I'm not going to be speaking about Kaspersky, and I guarantee you I'm not going to be speaking about my president. Right? Yeah? OK. Thank you. All right. Uh, so why don't we go ahead and kick off. Uh, I'll mention now, um, parts of this presentation are going to be quite technical. Not most of it. And I will always include analogies and all these other things if you are here in, in security, but not a uh, bit twiddler. Um, but uh, if you do want to be able to review some of the technical material, uh, if I go through it too fast, you would like to read it if you're a mathematician or if you're a computer scientist. Uh, our slides are already available for download uh, at this site here. Uh, we thank our, pal our partners uh, at Palador for getting that set up for us. So let's, let's get started on the real material here. All right. Uh, so we are CITL, a nonprofit organization based in the United States, uh, founded by our chief scientist, Sarah Zacco, uh, and our board chair, uh, Mudge. And our mission is a public good mission. Uh, we are hackers, but uh, our mission here is actually to look out for people who do not know very much about machines or as much as the other hackers do. Specifically, uh, we seek to improve the state of software security by providing the public with accurate reporting on the security of popular software, right? And so there's a mouthful for you. But uh, no doubt, no doubt, every single one of you has received questions of the form, what do I run on my phone? What do I do with this? What do I do with that? How do I protect myself? All of these other things. Lots of people in the general public looking for agency in computing. No one's offering it to them. And so we're trying to go ahead and uh, provide a forcing function on the software field uh, in order to, uh, you know, again, be able to enable consumers and users and all these things. Um, our social good work is funded largely by uh, uh, charitable monies from uh, the Ford Foundation, whom we thank a great deal. Uh, but we also have uh, major partnerships with uh, Consumer Reports, uh, which is a major organization in the United States that generally, broadly, looks at consumer goods uh, for safety and, and performance. Uh, but also partners with the Digital Standard, uh, which uh, probably would be of great interest to many people here at Congress, as it is a holistic standard for protecting user rights. We'll talk about uh, some of the work that goes into those things here in a bit. Um, but uh, first, uh, I want to give the big picture of what it is we're really trying to do in one, one short little sentence. Something like this, but for software security, right? What are the important facts? How does it rate? You know, is it easy to consume? Is it easy to go ahead and look and say, this thing is good, this thing is not good? Something like this but for software security. Sounds hard, doesn't it? <laughs> um, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about what I mean by something like this. Uh, there are lots of consumer outlook and uh, watchdog and protection groups, uh, both some private, some government, uh, which are looking to do this for various things that are not software security. 
Um, and you can see some examples here that are big in the United States. I happen to not like these as much as some of the newer consumer labels coming out from the EU. But uh, nonetheless, they are examples of the kinds of things people have done in other fields, fields that are not security, to try to achieve that same end. And when these things work well, it is for three reasons. One, it has to contain the relevant information. Two, it has to be based in fact. We're not talking opinions. This is not a book club or something like that. Uh, and then three, it has to be actionable. It has to be actionable. You have to be able to know how to make a decision based on it. How do you do that for software security? How do you do that for software security? So the rest of the talk is going to go in three parts. Uh, first, we're going to give a bit of an overview for uh, more of the consumer-facing uh, side of things for what we do, uh, look at some data that we have reported on early and, and all these other kinds of good things. Uh, we're then going to go ahead and get um, terrifyingly, terrifyingly technical. And then after that, we'll talk about tools to actually implement all of this stuff. The technical part comes before the tools. So it just tells you uh, how terrifyingly technical we're going to get. It's going to be fun. Right? So how do you do this for software security? A consumer version. So if you set forth to the task of trying to measure software security, right? many people here probably do work in the security field, perhaps as consultants, doing reviews. Certainly I used to. Uh, then probably what you're thinking to yourself right now is that there are lots and lots and lots and lots of things that affect the security of a piece of software, some of which are mm, you're only going to see them if you go reversing, and some of which are just you know, kicking around on the ground, waiting for you to notice, right? So uh, we're going to talk about both of those kinds of things that you might measure. Uh, but here you see uh, these giant charts that basically go through uh, on the left. Uh, on the left, <laughs> uh, we have uh, Microsoft Excel on OS X. On the right, uh, Google Chrome for OS X. This is um, a couple years old at this point, maybe one and a half years old. But uh, over here, I'm not expecting you to be able to read these. The real point is to say, look at all of the different things you can measure very easily. How do you distill it? How do you boil it down? Right. So this is uh, the opposite of a good consumer safety label. This is just, um, if you've ever done any consulting, this is the kind of report you hand a client to tell them how good their software is. Right. It's the opposite of consumer grade. Um, but the reason I'm showing it here is because you know, I'm going to call out some things, and maybe you can't process all of this because it's too much material, you know. But I'm going to call out some things, and once I call them out, just like NP, you're going to recognize them instantly. So, for example, Excel at the time of this review, look at this column of dots. What's this dots telling you? It's telling you, look at all these libraries. All of them are 32-bit only, not 64-bit, not 64-bit. Take a look at Chrome, exact opposite, exact opposite, 64-bit binary. Right. What are some other things? Uh, Excel, again, on OS X. Maybe you can see these danger warning lines that go straight, straight up the whole thing. Uh, that's uh, the absence of uh, major heat protection uh, flags uh, in, in the binary headers. We'll talk about some, what that means exactly in a bit. Um, but also, if you hop over here, you'll see, like, uh, yeah, 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 like Chrome has all of the different heat protections that a binary might enable. But uh, on OS X, that is. But uh, it also has uh, more dots in this column here off to the right. And what do those dots represent? Those dots represent um, functions, functions that uh, historically have been the source of, uh, you know, if you call these functions, they're very hard to call correctly. If you're a C programmer, the gets function is a good example, but there are lots of them. And you can see here that Chrome doesn't mind. It uses them all a bunch. And Excel, not so much. And if you know the history, of uh, Microsoft and the Trusted Computing Initiative and the SDL and all of that, you will know that a very long time ago, Microsoft made the decision and they said, we're going to start purging some of these uh, risky functions from our code bases because we think it's easier to ban them than teach our devs to use them correctly. And you see that reverberating out in their software. Google, on the other hand, says, yeah, 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 those functions can be dangerous to use, but if you know how to use them, they can be very good and so they're permitted. The point all of this is building to is that if you start by just measuring every little thing that like your static analyzers can detect in a piece of software, two things. One, you wind up with way more data than you can show in a slide. And two, the engineering process 
the software development life cycle that went into the software will leave behind artifacts that tell you something about the decisions that went into designing that engineering process. And so, uh, you know, Google, for example, quite rigorous as far as hitting, you know, GCC dash and then enable all of the compiler protections. Microsoft may be less good at that, but uh, um, much more rigid in things that uh, were very popular ideas when they introduced trusted computing. All right. So uh, the big takeaway from this material is uh, that, again, the software engineering process results in artifacts in the software that people can, uh, can, can find. All right. Okay, so that's, that's a whole bunch of data. Certainly, it's not a consumer-friendly label. So how do you start to get in towards the consumer zone? Well, the main defect of the big reports that we just saw is that it's too much information. It's uh, very dense on data, uh, but um, it's very hard to distill it to the so what of it, right? Uh, and so this here is uh, one of our earlier attempts to go ahead and do that distillation. What are these charts? How did we come up with these? Well, on the previous slide, when we saw all these different factors uh, that you can analyze in software, uh, basically, here's, here's, here's how we uh, arrive at this. For each of those things, pick a weight. Go ahead and compute a score, average against the weight, ta-da, now you have some number. You can do that for each of the libraries in the piece of software. And if you do that for each of the libraries in the software, you can then go ahead and produce these histograms to show, you know, ah, like uh, this percentage of the DLLs had a score in this range. Boom, there's a bar, right? Uh, how do you pick those weights? We'll talk about that in a sec. Uh, it's very technical. But the, the takeaway, though, is uh, you know, that you end up with these charts. Now, I've obscured the labels. I've obscured the labels. And the reason I've done that is uh, because I don't really care that much about the actual counts. I want to talk about the shapes, the shapes of these charts. It's a qualitative thing. So here, good scores appear on the right. Bad scores appear on the left. Uh, the histogram measuring all the libraries and components. And so a very secure piece of software in this model manifests as a tall bar far to the right. And you can see a clear example of that in our custom Gen 2 build. Anyone here who's a Gen 2 fan knows, hey, I'm going to install this thing. I think I'm going to go ahead and turn on every single one of those flags. And lo and behold, if you do that, yeah, you wind up with tall bar far to the right. Uh, here's Ubuntu 16. I, I bet it's 1604, but I don't recall exactly. 16 LTS. Uh, here you see a lot of tall bars to the right, not quite as consolidated as a custom Gen 2 build, but that makes sense, doesn't it, right? Because you, know, you don't do your whole Ubuntu build. Now I want to contrast. I want to contrast. So over here on the right, we see in the same model an analysis of the firmware obtained from two smart televisions, uh, last year's models uh, from Samsung and LG, and here are the model numbers. We did this work in uh, concert with Consumer Reports. And what do you notice about these histograms, right? Are the bars tall and to the right? No. They look almost normal, uh, not quite, but that doesn't really matter. The main thing that matters is that this is the shape you would expect to get if you were playing a random game, <laughs> basically, to decide what security features to enable in your software. This is the shape of not having a security program, is my bet. That's my bet. Uh, and so what do you see? You see heavy concentration here in the middle, right? That seems fair. And like it tails off. Uh, on the Samsung, nothing scored all that great. Same on the LG. Um, uh, both of them are you know, running their respective operating systems, and they're basically just inheriting whatever security came from, whatever open source thing they forked, right? Um, so this is, this is the kind of message. This right here is the kind of thing that we serve to exist for. This is, this is us producing charts showing that the current practices in the not-so-consumer-friendly space of running your own Linux distros far exceed the products being delivered, uh, certainly in this case in the smart TV market, but uh, I think you might agree with me, it's much worse than just that. Yeah. So. <clears throat> uh, Let's dig into that a little bit more. Um, I have a different point that I want to make about that same data set. Uh, so this table here, this table is again looking at the LG, Samsung, and uh, Gen 2 Linux installations. And on this table, we're just uh, pulling out some of the easy to identify uh, security features you might enable in a binary, right? Uh, so uh, 
percentage of binaries with address space layout randomization, right? Like, let's talk about that. Uh, on our Gen 2 build, it's over 99%. That also holds for the Amazon Linux AMI. It holds in Ubuntu. Uh, ASLR is incredibly common in modern Linux. And despite that, fewer than 70% of the binaries on the LG television had it enabled. Fewer than 70%. And the Samsung was doing you know, better than that, I guess. But 80% uh, is uh, pretty disappointing when a default Linux install, you know, mainstream Linux distro is going to get you 99, right? And it only gets worse. It only gets worse, right? Uh, you know, railroad support. Uh, if you don't know what that is, that's OK. But if you do, look at this abysmal coverage. Look at this abysmal coverage uh, coming out of these IoT devices. Uh, very sad. And you see it over and over and over again. I'm showing this because some people in this room or watching this video uh, ship software. <laughs> and I have a message. I have a message to those people who ship software who aren't working on, say, Chrome or any of the other big name uh, pwn to own kinds of targets. Uh, look at this. You can be leading the pack by mastering the fundamentals. You can be leading the pack by mastering the fundamentals. Uh, this is a point that really, as a security field, we really need to be driving home. Uh, you know, one of the things that we're seeing here in our data is that if you're the vendor who is shipping the product everyone has heard of in the security field, then maybe your game is pretty decent, right? If you're shipping, say, Windows or if you're shipping Firefox or whatever. But uh, if, you're, if you're doing one of these things where people are just kind of beating you up for default passwords, then uh, your problems are way further than just default passwords, right? Like uh, the, house, the house is messy. It needs to be cleaned. It needs to be cleaned. So uh, I'm, the rest of the talk, like I said, we're going to be discussing a lot of other things that amount to getting you know, a peek behind the curtain and where some of these things come from and getting very specific about how this business works. But if you're interested in uh, more of the high-level material, uh, especially if you're interested in uh, interesting results and insights, some of which I'm going to have here later, but uh, I really encourage you, though, to take a look at uh, the talk from this past summer uh, by our chief scientist, Sarah Zatko, uh, which is predominantly on the topic of uh, surprising results in the data. Uh, today, though, uh, this being our first time presenting here in Europe, uh, we figured we would take more of an overarching kind of view, what we're doing and uh, why we're excited about it and where it's headed. Uh, so we're about to move into a little bit of the underlying theory. Um, you know, why do I think it's reasonable uh, to even try to measure the security of software from a technical perspective? Uh, but before we can get into that, I need to talk a little bit about our goals uh, so that the uh, decisions in the theory, are, uh, the motivation is clear, right? Our goals are really simple. Uh, uh, it's a very easy organization to run because of that. Um, goal number one, remain independent of vendor influence. We are not the first organization to purport to be looking out for the consumer. But uh, unlike many of our predecessors, we are not taking money from the people we review, right? Seems like some basic stuff. Uh, <laughs> seems like some basic stuff, right? Thank you, okay. Uh, <laughs> two, automated, comparable, quantitative analysis. Why automated? Well, we need our test results to be reproducible. And Tim goes in, opens up your software in IDA, and finds a bunch of stuff that makes him all stoked. Uh, it's not a very repeatable <laughs> kind of uh, standard for things. And so we're interested in things which are automated. We'll talk about maybe a few hackers in here know how hard that is. We'll talk about that. Uh, but then lastly, also, we're acting as a watchdog. We're protecting the interests of uh, the user uh, or the consumer, however you would like to look at it. Um, but we also have three non-goals, three non-goals that are equally important. One, uh, we have a non-goal of finding and disclosing vulnerabilities. I reserve the right to find and disclose vulnerabilities, but that's not my goal. That's not my goal. Another non-goal is to tell software vendors what to do. If a vendor asks me how to remediate their terrible score, I will tell them what we are measuring, but I'm not there to help them remediate it. It's on them to be able to ship a secure product without me holding their hand. Uh, <laughs> we'll see. Uh, and then three, uh, non-goal, uh, perform free security testing for vendors. Our testing happens after you release. Because when you release your software, you are telling people it is ready to be used. Is it really, though? Is it really, though? Right? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. So we are not there to give you a preview of what your score will be. Uh, there is no sum of money you can hand me that will get you an early preview of what your score is. You can try me. You can try me. There's a fee for trying me. 
There's a fee for trying me, but uh, I'm not going to look at your stuff until I'm ready to drop it, right? <laughs> yeah, beta, yeah. All right, so uh, moving into this theory territory, um, three big questions, three big questions that need to be addressed if you want to do our work efficiently. What works? What works for improving security? What are the things that need or that you really want to see in software? Two, how do you recognize when it's being done? Uh, it's no good if someone hands you a piece of software and says, I've done all of the latest things, and it's a complete black, black box. If you can't check the claim, the claim is as good as false in practical terms, period, right? Software has to be reviewable, or a priori, uh, I, I think you're full of it. <laughs> uh, and then three, uh, who's doing it? Of all the things that work, that you can recognize, who's actually doing it? Uh, you know, let's go ahead. Our field is famous for ruining people's holidays and weekends over Friday bug disclosures, you know, uh, New Year's Eve bug disclosures. Uh, I would like us to also be famous for calling out uh, those uh, teams and those software organizations which are uh, being as good as the bad guys are being bad. Yeah? So provide someone an incentive to be uh, maybe happy to see us for a change, right? <laughs> okay. So, uh, <clears throat> thank you. Yeah, all right. So, uh, how do we actually pull these things off, the basic idea? So, um, I'm going to get into some deeper theory. If you're not a theorist, I want you to focus on this slide. Uh, and I'm going to bring it back. Um, it's not all theory from here on out after this, but if you're not a theorist, I really want you to focus on this slide. Um, the basic motivation, the basic motivation behind what we're doing, the technical motivation, why we think that it's possible to measure and report on security, it all boils down to this, right? So we start with a, a thought experiment, a good done kind, right? Uh, given a piece of software, we can ask, overall, how secure is it? Kind of a vague question, but you could imagine, you know, there's versions of that question. And two, uh, what are its vulnerabilities? Um, Maybe you want to nitpick with me about what the word vulnerability means, but broadly, you know, this is a much more specific question, right? Um, and here's, here's the enticing thing. The first question appears to ask for less information than the second question. And uh, maybe uh, if we were taking bets, I would put my money on, yes, it actually does ask for less information. What do I mean by that? What do I mean by that? Well, let's say that someone told you all of the vulnerabilities in a system, right? They said, hey, I got them all, right? You're like, all right, that's cool, that's cool. And someone asks you, hey, how secure is this system? You can give them a very precise answer. You can say it has N vulnerabilities and they're of this kind and like all this stuff, right? So certainly the second question is enough to answer the first. But is the reverse true? Namely, if someone were to tell you, for example, hey, this piece of software has exactly 32 vulnerabilities in it, does that make it easier to find any of them, right? Um, there's room for it to maybe do that using some algorithms that are not yet in existence. Uh, certainly the computer scientists in here are saying, well, you know, uh, yeah, maybe counting the number of SAT solutions doesn't help you practically find solutions, but it might, and we just don't know. Okay, fine, fine, fine. Maybe these things are the same, but uh, the, my experience in security and the experience of many others perhaps is that they probably aren't the same question. And this motivates... Uh, uh, what I'm calling here Zatko's question, which is basically asking for an algorithm that demonstrates that the first question is easier than the second question, right? So Zatko's question, develop a heuristic which can effic efficiently answer one, but not necessarily two. If you're looking for a metaphor, if you want to know why I care about this distinction, I want you to think about some certain controversial technologies. Maybe think about, say, nuclear technology, right? An algorithm that answers one, but not two, it's a very safe algorithm to publish. Very safe algorithm to publish, indeed. Okay. Claude Shannon would like more information. Happy to oblige. Let's take a look at uh, this question from a different perspective, maybe a more hands-on perspective, the hacker perspective, right? Uh, if you're a hacker and you're watching me up here and I'm waving my hands around and I'm showing you charts, maybe you're thinking to yourself, yeah, boy, what do you got, right? How does this actually go? And maybe what you're thinking to yourself is that, you know, finding good vulns, that's an artisan craft, right? You're an Ida. You know, you're reversing Ole, you're doing all these things, you're hitting calm, I don't know, all that stuff. And like, you know, this kind of clever game, cleverness is not like this thing that um, feels very automatable. 
Um, but, uh, you know, on the other hand, um, there are a lot of tools that do automate things, and so it's not completely not automatable. And uh, if you're uh, into fuzzing, then perhaps uh, you are aware of this very simple observation, uh, which is that if your harness is perfect, if you really know what you're doing, if you have a decent fuzzer, then in principle, fuzzing can find every single problem. You have to be able to look for it, you have to be able to harness for it, but in principle, it will. Right. So the hacker perspective on Zacco's question is maybe of two minds. On the one hand, um, assessing security is a game of cleverness. But on the other hand, we're kind of right now at the cusp of having some game-changing tech really go. Well, maybe you're saying like fuzzing is not at the cusp. I promise it's just at the cusp. We haven't seen all the fuzzing has to offer. Right? And so maybe there's room. Maybe there's room for uh, some automation to be possible in pursuit of Zacco's question. Of course. There are many challenges still in um, you know, using existing hacker technology, uh, mostly of the form of various open questions. Uh, for example, if you're into fuzzing, you know, hey, identifying unique crashes, there's an open question. We'll talk about some of those. We'll talk about some of those. But I'm going to offer another perspective here. Uh, so maybe you're not in the business of doing software reviews, but you know a little computer science. And maybe that computer science has you wondering, what's this guy talking about, right? Uh, I'm here to acknowledge that. <laughs> uh, so um, whatever you think the word security means, I've got a list of questions up here. Whatever you think the word security means, probably some of these questions are relevant to your definition. Right? Uh, does the software have a hidden backdoor or any kind of hidden functionality? Does it handle crypto material correctly, et cetera, so forth? Uh, anyone in here who knows some computer th building theory knows that every single one of these questions and many others like them are undecidable due to reasons essentially no different than the reason the halting problem is undecidable, which is to say due to reasons essentially first identified and studied by Alan Turing a long time before we had microarchitectures and all these other things. And so the computability perspective says that, you know, whatever your definition of security is, ultimately you have this recognizability problem, fancy way of saying that algorithms won't be able to recognize secure software because of the undecidability of these issues. The takeaway, the takeaway is that the computability angle on all of this says anyone who's in the business that we're in has to use heuristics. You have to. You have to. All right. This guy gets it. <coughs> All right. So on the tech side, uh, our last um, technical perspective that we're going to take now is certainly uh, the most abstract, which is the Bayesian perspective. Right? So if you're a frequentist, you need to get with the times. <laughs> uh, you know, it's everything Bayesian now. Uh, so let's talk about this for a bit. Only two slides of math, I promise. Only two. So uh, let's say that I have some corpus of software. Perhaps it's the collection of all modern browsers. Perhaps it's the collection of all the packages in the Debian repository. Perhaps it's everything on GitHub that builds on this system. Perhaps it's a hard drive full of wares that some guy mailed you, right? Uh, you have some corpus of software. And for random soft program in that corpus, we can consider uh, this probability, the probability distribution of which software is secure versus which is not. Uh, for reasons described on the computability perspective, uh, this number is not a computable number for any reasonable definition of security. Uh, so that's neat. Um, and so uh, for practical terms, uh, if you want to do some probabilistic reasoning, you need some surrogate for that. Uh, and so we consider this here. Uh, so instead of considering the probability that a piece of software is secure, a non-computable, non-verifiable claim, we take a look here at uh, this indexed collection of probabilities. This is an infinite countable family of probability distributions. Uh, basically, P sub HK is just the probability that for a random piece of software in the corpus, H work units of fuzzing will find no more than K unique crashes, right? And uh, why is this relevant? Well, at the bottom, we have this analytic observation, which is that in the limit as h goes to infinity, you're basically saying, hey, you know, if I fuzz this thing for infinity times, you know, uh, what's that look like? And, and uh, essentially here we have analytically that this should converge, that p sub h sub 1, uh, h comma 1 should converge to the probability that a piece of software just simply cannot be made to crash. Not the same thing as being secure, but certainly not uh, a small concern relevant to security. So none of that stuff actually was Bayesian yet, uh, so we need to get there. Uh, and so um, here we go, right? So the previous slide described a probability distribution measured based on fuzzing. Um, but fuzzing is expensive, and it is also not an answer to Zacco's question because it finds vulnerabilities. It doesn't measure security in the general sense. Uh, and so 
here's where we make the jump to conditional probabilities. Let M be some observable property of software. As ASLR, as Railro, calls these functions, doesn't call those functions. Take your pick. Um, for random S and S, we now consider these conditional probability distributions. And this is the same kind of probability as we had on the previous slide, uh, but conditioned on this observable being true. Uh, and this leads to the refined, the SIDL variant of Zacco's question. Which observable properties of software uh, satisfy that uh, when the software has property M, the probability of fuzzing being hard is very high? That's what this version of this question phrases. And here we say, you know, in large log H over K. In other words, uh, exponentially more fuzzing than you expect to find bugs. So this is the technical version of what we're after. Um, all of this can be explored. You can brute force your way to finding all of this stuff. And that's exactly what we're doing. Yeah. So uh, we're looking for all kinds of things. We're looking for all kinds of things that correlate with uh, fuzzing having low yield on a piece of software. And uh, there's a lot of ways in which that can happen. Uh, it could be that you are looking at a feature of software that literally prevents crashes. Uh, maybe it's the never crash flag. I don't know, right? But um, most of the things I've talked about, ASLR, Railroad, et cetera, don't prevent crashes. In fact, ASLR can take non-crashing programs and make them crashing. It's the number one reason vendors don't enable it, right? So why am I talking about ASLR? Why am I talking about Railroad? Why am I talking about all these things that have nothing to do with stopping crashes and I'm claiming I'm measuring crashes? It's because in the Bayesian perspective, correlation is not the same thing as causation, right? Correlation is not the same thing as causation. It could be that M's presence literally prevents crashes, but it could also be that by some underlying coincidence, the things we're looking for are mostly only found in software that's robust against crashing. If you're looking for security, I submit to you that the difference doesn't matter. OK. End of my math. Danke. Uh, we'll now go ahead and do this like a really nice analogy of all those things that I just described. Right? So we're looking for indicators of a piece of software being secure enough to be good for consumers. Right? And so here's an analogy. Let's say you're a geologist. You study minerals and all of that, and you're looking for diamonds. Who isn't? Right? Want those diamonds. And like, how do you find diamonds? Um, even in places that are rich in diamonds, diamonds are not common. You don't just go walking around in your boots, kicking until your stow tubs on a diamond. Right? You don't do that. Instead, you look for other minerals that are mostly only found near diamonds, but are much more abundant in those locations than the diamonds, right? And so this is <sighs> mineral science 101, I guess. I don't know. So uh, for example, you want to go find diamond, put on your boots, and go kick it until you find some chromite. Look for some diopside. You know, look for some garnet. None of these things turn into diamonds. None of these things cause diamonds. But if you're finding good concentrations of these things, then statistically, there's probably diamonds nearby. That's what we're doing. We're not looking for the things that cause good security per se. Rather, we're looking for the indicators that you have put the effort into your software. All right. How's that working out for us? How's that working out for us? Well, we're still doing studies. Uh, it's you know, early to say exactly, but we do have the following interesting coincidence. And so uh, here presented, uh, I have a collection of uh, prices that somebody gave Mudge for uh, so-called uh, underground exploits. Um, and uh, I can tell you these prices are um, maybe a little low these days, but uh, if you work in that business, if you go to SciScan, if you do that kind of stuff, maybe you know that uh, this is a uh, it's ballpark. It's ballpark, right? And uh, just a coincidence, maybe it means we're on the right track, I don't know, but it's an encouraging sign. When we run these programs through our analysis, our rankings more or less correspond to the actual prices that you encounter in the wild uh, for access via these applications. Uh, up above, I have one of our histogram charts. Uh, you can see here that Chrome and Edge in this particular model scored very close to the same, and it's a test model, so let's say they're basically the same. Uh, Firefox, you know, um, you know, behind there a little bit. I don't have Safari on this chart because these are all Windows applications, but the Safari score falls in between. So uh, lots of theory, lots of theory, lots of theory, and then uh, we have this. So uh, we're going to go ahead now and hand off uh, to uh, our lead engineer, Parker, uh, who's going to talk about some of the concrete stuff, the non-chalkboard stuff, the software stuff that actually makes this work. Yeah, so I want to talk about the process of actually doing it. 
building the tooling that's required to collect these observables. Effectively, how do you go mining for indicator, inter, indicator minerals? But first, the progression of where we are and where we're going. We initially broke this out into three major tracks of our technology. We have our static analysis engine, which started as a prototype, and we have now recently completed a much more mature and solid engine that's allowing us to be much more extensible and dig it deeper into programs and provide much more deep observables. Then we have the data collection and data reporting. Tim showed some of our early stabs at this, but we're right now in the process of building new engines to make the data more accessible and easy to work with, and hopefully more of that will be available soon. Finally, we have our uh, fuzzer track. We needed to get some early data, so we played with some existing off-the-shelf fuzzers, including AFL. And while that was fun, unfortunately, it's a lot of work to manually instrument a lot of fuzzers for hundreds of binaries. So we then built an automated solution that started to get us closer to having a fuzzing harness that could auto-generate itself, depending on the, software itself, the software's behavior. But right now, unfortunately, that technology showed us more deficiencies than it showed its successes. So we are now working on a much more mature fuzzer that will allow us to dig deeper into programs as we're running and collect very specific things that we need for our uh, model and our analysis. But our an analytic pipeline today, this is one of the most concrete components of our engine and one of the most fun. We effectively wanted some type of software hopper where you could just pour programs in, installers, and then on the other end come reports, uh, fully annotated, and actionable information that we can present to people. So we went about the process of building a large-scale engine. It starts off with a simple REST API where we can push software in, which then gets moved over to our computation cluster. That effectively provides us a fabric to work with. It makes uh, made up of a lot of different software suites, starting off with our data processing, which is done by Apache Spark, and then moves over into data, uh, data handling and data analysis in, in Spark. And then we have the common HDFS layer to provide a place for the data to be stored, and then a resource manager in Yarn. All of that is backed by our compute and data nodes, which scale out linearly. That then moves into our data science engine, which is effectively Spark with Apache Zeppelin, which provides us a really fun interface where we can work with the data in an interactive manner, but be kicking off large-scale jobs into the cluster. And finally, this goes into our report generation engine. What this bought us was the ability to linearly scale and make that hopper bigger and bigger as we need, but also provide us a way to process data that doesn't fit in a single machine's RAM. You can push the instance sizes as large as you want, but we have data sets that blow away any single, single host RAM set. So this allows us to work with really large collections of observables. I want to dive down now into our actual static analysis. But first, we have to explore the problem space, because it's a nasty one. Effectively, in Siddle's mission is to process as much software as possible. Uh, hopefully, all of it. But it's hard to get your hand on all the binaries that are out there. But when you start to look at that problem, you understand there's a lot of combinations. There's a lot of CPU architectures. There's a lot of operating systems. There's a lot of file formats. There's a lot of environments the software gets deployed into, and every single one of them has their own app, archer, app armory features. And they can be specifically set for one combination, but not another. And you don't want to penalize a developer for not turning on a feature they had no access to ever turn on. So effectively, we need to solve this in a much more generic way. And so what we did is our static analysis engine effectively looks like a gigantic collection of abstraction libraries to handle binary programs. You take in some type of input file, be it elf, p, mako, and then the pipeline splits. It goes off into two major analyzer classes, our format analyzers, which look at the software much like how a linker or loader would look at it. I want to understand how it's going to be loaded up, what type of armory feature is going to be applied, and then we can run analyzers over that. In order to achieve that, we need abstraction libraries that can provide us an abstract memory map, a symbol resolver, generic section properties. 
So all that feeds in, and then we run over a collection of analyzers to collect data and observables. Next, we have our code analyzers. These are the analyzers that run over the code itself and need to be able to look at the ex every possible executable path. In order to do that, we need to do function discovery, feed that into a control flow uh, recovery engine, and then as a post-processing step, dig through all of the possible metadata in the software, such as like a, uh, a switch table or something like that, to get even deeper into the software. Then this provides us a basic list of basic blocks, functions, and instruction ranges, and does so in an efficient manner so we can process a lot of software as it goes. Then all of that gets fed over into the main uh, modular analyzers. Finally, all of this comes together and gets put into a gigantic blob of observables and fed up to the pipeline. We really want to thank uh, the Ford Foundation for supporting our work in this, because it's uh, the pipeline and the static analysis has been a massive boon for our project, and we're only beginning now to really get our, uh, our engine running, and we're having a great time with it. So digging into the observables themselves, what are we looking at? And let's, let's break them apart. So the format structure components, things like ASLR, DEP, RHEL row, basic app armoring that's going to go into the feature and be, and going to be enabled at the OS layer when it gets loaded up or linked. Then we also collect other metadata about the program, uh, such as like what libraries are linked in, what's its dependency tree look like completely, how did those, software, how did those libraries score? because that can affect your main software. F interesting example, on Linux, if you link a library that requires an executable stack, guess what? Your software now has an executable stack even if, even if you didn't mark that. So we need to be able to understand what ecosystem the software is going to live in. And the code structure analyzers look at things like functionality. What's the software doing? How, what type of app armoring is getting injected into the code? Great example of that is something like stack guards or fortify source. These are our main features that only really apply and can be observed inside of the control flow uh, or inside of the actual instructions themselves. This is why control flow graphs are key. We played around with a, a number of different ways of analyzing software that we could scale out, and ultimately we had to come down to working with control flow graphs. Provided here is a, a basic visualization of what I'm talking about with a control flow graph provided by Binja, which has wonderful visualization tools, uh, hence this photo, and not our engine because we don't build very, very many visualization engines. But you basically have a function that's broken up into basic blocks, which is broken up into instructions, and then you have basic flow between them. Having this as an iterable structure that we can work with allows us to walk over that and walk every single instruction, understand the references, understand where code and data is being, uh, is being referenced and how is it being referenced. And then what type of functionality is being used. So this is a great way to find something like whether or not your stack guards are being applied on every function that needs them, how, how deep are they being applied? And is the compiler possibly introducing errors into your armory features, which are interesting side studies? Also why we did this is because we want to push the concept of what type of observables even farther. Let's say, take this, in, uh, take this example. You want to be able to take instruction abstractions. Let's say, for all major architectures, you can, you can break, break them up into major categories, be it arithmetic instructions, data manipulation instructions, like load stores, and then control flow instructions. Then, with these basic fundamental building blocks, you can make artifacts. Think of them like an, a unit of functionality. It has some type of input, some type of output, provides some type of operation on it, and then, with these little units of functionality, you can link them together. And think of these artifacts as maybe sub-basic block or crossing a few basic blocks, but a different way to break up the software, because a basic block is just a branch break. But we want to look at functionality breaks, because these artifacts can provide the basic fundamental building blocks of the software itself. It's more important when we want to start doing symbolic lifting so that we can lift the entire software up into a generic, uh, a generic representation that we can slice and dice as needed. 
Moving from there, I want to talk about fuzzing a little bit more. Fuzzing is effectively at the heart of our project. It provides us the rich data set that we can use to derive a model. It also provides us awesome other metadata on the side. But why? Why do we care about fuzzing? Why is fuzzing the metric that you build an engine that, or build a model that you derive some type of, uh, some type of reason from? So think of the set of bugs, vulnerabilities, and exploitable vulnerabilities. In an ideal world, you'd want to just have a machine that pulls out exploitable vulnerabilities. Unfortunately, this is exceedingly costly for a series of decision problems that go between these sets. So now consider the superset of bugs or faults. A fuzzer can easily recognize, or other software can easily recognize faults. But if you want to move down the sets, you unfortunately need to <laughs> jump through a lot of decision hoops. For example, if you want to move to a vulnerability, you have to understand, does the attacker have some type of control? Is there a trust boundary being crossed? Is this software configured in the right way for this to be vulnerable right now? So there are human factors that are not deducible from the outside. You then amplify this decision problem even worse going to exploitable vulnerabilities. So if we collect the superset of bugs, we will know that there is some proportion of subsets in there, and this provides us a data set that's easily recognizable, and we can collect a cost in a cost-efficient manner. Finally, fuzzing is key, and we're investing a lot of our time right now in working on a new fuzzing engine because there are some key things we want to do. We want to be able to understand all of the different paths the software could be taking. And as you're fuzzing, you're effectively driving the software down as many unique paths while referencing as many unique data uh, manipulations as possible. So if we save off every path, annotate the ones that are faulting, we now have this beautiful rich data set of exactly where the software went as we were driving it in specific ways. Then we feed that back into our static analysis engine and begin to generate those instruction, artif uh, those instruction abstractions, those artifacts. And with that, imagine we have these gigantic traces of instruction abstractions. From there, we can then begin to train the model to explore around the fault location and begin to understand and try and study the fundamental building blocks of what a bug, look like, bug looks like in an abstract, instruction agnostic way. And this is why we're spending a lot of time on our fuzzing engine right now. But hopefully soon we'll be able to talk about that more in maybe a tech track and not the policy track. Yeah. So from then on, when anything went wrong with the computer, we said it had bugs in it. <laughs> All right. Well, I promised you a technical journey. I promised you a technical journey into the dark abyss of as deep as you want to get with it. Uh, so let's go ahead and bring it up. Let's, uh, let's wrap it up and uh, bring it up a little bit here. Uh, we've talked a great deal today about some theory. We've talked about uh, development and our tooling and everything else. And so I figured I should end with uh, some things that are not in progress, but in fact, which are done in yesterday's news, uh, just to go ahead and make that uh, shared here with Europe. Uh, so uh, in the midst of all of our development, we have been uh, discovering and reporting bugs. Again, this is uh, not our primary purpose, really, but uh, you, know, you can't help but do it. You know how computers are these days. Y you find bugs just for turning them on, right? So uh, we've been uh, disclosing all of that. Um, a little while ago at uh, uh, DEF CON and Black Hat, our C chief scientist, uh, Sarah, uh, together with Mudge, uh, went ahead and dropped this bombshell on the Firefox team, which is that for some period of time, uh, they had ASLR disabled on OS X. Uh, when we first found it, we assumed it was a bug in our tools. Uh, when we first mentioned it in a talk, they came to us and said it's definitely a bug in our tools, or might be, or some level of surprise. And then uh, people started looking into it. And in fact, at one point, it had been enabled and then temporarily disabled. No one knew. Everyone thought it was on. It takes someone looking to notice that kind of stuff, right? <laughs> uh, major shout out, though. They fixed it immediately, despite our uh, full disclosure on stage and everything. So um, very impressed. Uh, but uh, in addition to popping surprises on people, we've also been doing the usual process of submitting patches and bugs, particularly to uh, LLVM and QMU. And uh, if you work in software analysis, you can probably guess why. Um, 
Incidentally, if you're looking for a target to fuzz, if you want to go home from CCC and you want to find a ton of findings, uh, LLVM comes with a bunch of parsers. You should fuzz them. You should fuzz them, and I say that because I know for a fact you are going to get a bunch of findings, and it'd be really nice. I would appreciate it if I didn't have to pay the people to fix them. So if you wouldn't mind disclosing them, that would help. Uh, but to, besides these bug reports and all these other things, uh, we've also been working with lots of others. Uh, you know, we gave a talk uh, earlier this summer, Sarah gave a talk earlier this summer about these things, and she presented findings on uh, comparing some of these base scores of different Linux distributions. And based on uh, those findings, uh, there was a person on the Fedora Red Team, Jason Calloway, who sat there and, well, I, I can't read his mind, but I'm sure that he was thinking to himself, golly, it would be nice to not you know, be surprised uh, at the next one of these talks. Uh, they scored very well, by the way. They were uh, leading in many, in many of our, our metrics. Well, in any case, uh, he left Vegas and he went back home and uh, him and his colleagues have been working on essentially re-implementing much of our tooling so that they can check the stuff that we check before they release. Before they release. Looking for security before you release. So that would be a good thing for others to do. And uh, I'm hoping that that idea really catches on. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right? That would be nice. That would be nice. But, uh, uh, but uh, in addition to that, in addition to that, uh, our mission really is to get results out to the public. And so in order to achieve that, uh, we have broad partnerships with Consumer Reports and the Digital Standard. Uh, especially if you're into cyber policy, I really encourage you to take a look at the proposed uh, Digital Standard, which is encompassing of the things we look for and, and, and so much more. EULA's data traffic, uh, motion, and cryptography, and update mechanisms, and all that good stuff. So where we are and where we're going, uh, the big takeaways here, if you're, if you're looking for that so what, three points for you. One, we are uh, building the tooling necessary to do larger and larger and larger studies regarding these uh, surrogate security stores. Uh, my hope is that in some period uh, of the not too distant future, I would like to be able to uh, with my colleagues publish uh, some really nice findings about what are the things that you can observe in software which have a suspiciously high correlation with the software being good, right? Uh, nobody really knows right now. It's an empirical question. As far as I know, the study hasn't been done. We've been running it on the small scale. We're building the tooling to do it on a much larger scale. We are hoping that this winds up being a useful field uh, in security as that technology develops. Uh, in the meantime, our static analyzers are made, already making surprising discoveries. Hit YouTube and uh, take a look uh, for Sarah Zacco's recent talks at DEF CON Black Hat. Uh, lots of fun findings in there. Lots of uh, things that uh, anyone who looks would have found it. Lots of that. And then lastly, if you are in the business of shipping software and you are thinking to yourself, okay, so these guys, someone gave them some money to mess up my day, and you're wondering, what can I do to not have my day messed up? One simple piece of advice. One simple piece of advice. Make sure your software employs every exploit mitigation technique Mudge has ever or will ever hear of. And he's heard of a lot of them, and he's only going to, you know, all that. Turn all those things on. And if you don't know anything about that stuff, if nobody on your team knows anything about that stuff, uh, then why, 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 I don't even know why I'm saying this. If you're here, you know about that stuff, so do that. If you're not here, then you should be here. <laughs> danke, danke. Thank you, Tim and Parker. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? It's really hard to see you with that bright light in my face. <laughs> <laughs> I think the signal angel has a question. So the IOC channel was uh, impressed by your tools and your models that you wrote, and they are wondering what's going to happen to that, uh, because you do have funding from the Ford Foundation now, and so what are your plans with this? Do you plan on commercializing this, or is it going to be open source, or how do we get our hands on this? It's an excellent question. So uh, for the time being, uh, the money that we are receiving is to develop the tooling, uh, pay for the AWS instances, pay for the engineers and all that stuff. Uh, the direction as an organization that we would like to take things, uh, I have no interest in running a monopoly. That sounds like a fantastic amount of work, and I really don't want to do it. However, uh, I have a great deal of interest in taking the gains that we are making in the technology and releasing the data uh, so that other competent researchers can go through and find useful things that we may not have noticed ourselves. Uh, so we're not at a point where we are releasing data in bulk just yet, but that is simply a matter of uh, engineering. Our tools are still in flux uh, as we you know, when we do that, we want to make sure the data is correct, and so our software has to have its own low bug counts and all these other things. 
But ultimately, uh, for the scientific aspect of our mission, though the science is not our primary mission, our primary mission is to apply it to help consumers. Uh, at the same time, it is our belief that an opaque model is as good as crap. No one should trust an opaque model. Uh, if somebody is telling you that they have uh, some statistics and they do not provide you with any underlying data and it is not reproducible, you should ignore them. Consequently, uh, what we are working towards right now is getting to a point where we will be able to share all of those findings, the surrogate scores, the interesting correlations between observables and fuzzing. All of that will be public uh, as the material comes online. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And microphone number three, please. Hi. Uh, thanks. There's some really interesting work you presented here. Um, so there's something I, I'm not sure I understand about the approach that you're taking. Um, if you are evaluating the security of, say, a library function or the implementation of a network protocol, for example, uh, you know, there'd be a precise specification you could check that against. Um, and the techniques you're using would make sense to me. Um, but it's not so clear, since you set, the goal that you've set for yourself is to evaluate the security of consumer software, um, it, it's not clear to me whether it's fair to call these results security scores in the absence of a threat model. So, so my question is, you know, how is it meaningful yeah. to make a claim that a piece of software is secure if you don't have a threat model for it? This is an excellent question, and I, uh, anyone who disagrees is, uh, they should, they're wrong. <laughs> uh, security without a threat model is not security at all. Uh, that's absolutely a, a true point. So the things that we are looking for, uh, most of them are things that you will already find present in your threat model. Uh, and so, for example, we are reporting on the presence of things like ASLR and lots of other things that um, get to the heart of exploitability of a piece of software. Uh, so, for example, if we are reviewing a piece of software that has no attack surface, uh, then it is canonically not in the threat model, and in that sense, it makes no sense to report on its overall security. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if we're talking about software like, say, a word processor, a browser, anything on your phone, anything that talks on the network, if we're talking about those kinds of applications, then I would argue that the exploit mitigations and the other things that we are measuring are almost certainly very relevant. So there's a sense in which what we are measuring is the lowest common denominator among what we imagine are the dominant threat models for the applications. It's a hand wavy answer, but uh, I promised heuristics, so there you go. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Any questions? No raising hands. Okay, uh, and then the Herald can ask a question because I never can. <laughs> yeah. So um, the question is: You uh, mentioned earlier the security labels, and um, for example, what institution could uh, give out these security labels? Because as obviously the vendor has no uh, interest yeah. in IT security. Yeah. Yes, uh, it's a very good question. So our partnership with Consumer Reports, uh, I don't uh, know if you're familiar with them, but in the United States, Consumer Reports is a major, huge. Uh, consumer watchdog organization. Uh, they test the safety of automobiles. Uh, they test, you know, lots of uh, consumer appliances, all kinds of things, both to see if they function more or less as advertised, but most importantly, they're checking for quality, reliability, and safety. Uh, so our partnership with uh, Consumer Reports is all about us doing our work and them publishing that. And so, for example, the televisions uh, that we presented the data on, all of that was collected and published in uh, partnership with Consumer Reports. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? From the stream? I hear a no. Well, in this case, people, thank you. Thank uh, Tim and Parker for their nice talk, and please give them a very, very warm round of applause. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thanks.